with him. 
They searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so in a manger filled with hay, God's only son was born. by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. It was just as the angel said, you'll find him in a manger bed. Emmanuel And die 
for me and you. That rugged cross was my cross too. My cell and rust was my cross too. Still every breath you drew was hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Gus, uh, for leading us in worship. Hallelujah to the Christ child. Well, I wasn't going to start this way, but uh, there's a group of folks drove up from Sweeney this morning to be with us, so I, I guess I need to recognize them from my home church. Um, sweet folks, uh, they're, uh, they're family, and so appreciate you coming and uh, sharing this morning with us. Let me start by saying uh, I feel humbled to be here today. Six months ago, Melanie and I had uh, no idea that God would take us from small town Sweeney to the bustling city of Conroe and place me in a different church position with so many changes in life. This wasn't my plan, but thankfully, God's ways are so much higher than mine and he knows exactly what and where we need to be to serve him fully. I'm thrilled to speak during the Christmas season. Uh, the last four Sundays have been awe-inspiring. Uh, Dr. Gross's sermons on the messages portrayed in popular Christmas carols were, were delightful. Uh, I really enjoyed them. And last week's service, celebrating uh, the birth of the Christ child through music and song, blessed my heart. Wasn't it great? The spirit just filled this place. Uh, and Melanie and I feel that being able to serve here, to grow spiritually here, and to fellowship among you is one of the greatest gifts we have received this Christmas. So uh, thank you, Dr. Gross and the church for allowing us to be here. Christmas is a joyous celebration. We've talked about Jesus' birth and how his coming was God's gift of salvation for all mankind. The prophet Simeon had been taught as a Hebrew child to look for the coming Messiah, the one God would send to free his people from the bondage of slavery. And so for years he watched and prayed and searched. And finally it happened. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the second chapter of Luke? We'll be reading starting at verses 25 and going through 32. And would you stand as we honor God's word as we read Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and he and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Thank you. You may be seated. Wow. 
What an exhilarating moment this must have been for Simeon and for Mary and Joseph. Simeon had just proclaimed to those in the temple within hearing distance that this baby boy was the Christ child foretold by the prophets. The angels had proclaimed him to Mary and Joseph, who believed what they said, but now Simon was reaffirming that call on their son to be the savior of the world. Can you imagine Simeon waking up that morning, going about his normal routine, and suddenly the Holy Spirit impresses upon him, Simeon, you need to go to the temple. Now, Scripture says that he was righteous and devout. So when the Holy Spirit spoke to him, he was listening, and he recognized his voice. Because he had committed his life to serve the Lord, he was obedient and went to the temple. And there among the crowd of people, and I'm sure other children and maybe even other babies being dedicated to the Lord, the Holy Spirit led him to Jesus. As he held the Messiah in his arms, his heart's desire had been fulfilled. God's promise complete. But it didn't end there. He had more to proclaim. So let's continue reading through verses 33 and 35. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. In the midst of Mary and Joseph's great joy, Simeon reveals to them the reality of the nature of man and the consequences of sin. Jesus was the picture of God's love and grace walking in a world filled with selfishness and pride. When Jesus loved people, and gave them dignity and self-worth through a relationship with him and their heavenly father, religious leaders of that day fought back, trying to maintain control that they had established over Israel by their laws and righteous living. Jesus' message would bring joy to those who received it, but anger and remorse to those who refused it. Because of Jesus' entrance into the world, it will become evident and is evident where our heart's desires lie. And each one of us will have to choose to accept him or reject him. Then Simeon prophesied about Jesus' coming death and how it would break Mary's heart. In a moment, this event which had been filled with joy and hope became sober and foreboding. In the eighth chapter of Romans, Paul talks about when we give our heart to Jesus, we are led by the Spirit of God and become children of God. We call him Abba, Father, and his Spirit affirms that we are God's children. And that's not just us claiming it, that's his Spirit affirming it. So let's read from Romans chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 17 and go through 23. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us 
as a foretaste of future glory. Wow. Sharing in the glory of God and all that he has given and promised us is a marvelous blessing. Uh, Just being your brother in Christ and uh, enjoying the fellowship of this family is, is an amazing thing. Am I not right? But as Paul said, all creation groans because of the curse and sin and the results of death and decay. He even says that we as believers groan because we have to deal with the frailties of these earthly bodies as they begin to wear out, causing us pain and physical limitations. But we also groan over loss of loved ones, especially during this Christmas season. It seems like every week this year, we have learned that one of our own church family has gone to be with the Lord. I know that can make this Christmas season difficult as you deal with the memories of those lost loved ones. I know because I've lost loved ones in December as well. In 2004, I received a call from my sister telling me, that mom and dad were involved in a car wreck returning home from a family reunion. She said that mom was in the hospital uh, with minor uh, injuries, but that we had lost dad. Our family groaned. I know that many of you have received a call similar to that. But also in 2008, my brother at the age of 58 decided He wanted to run in a marathon. I would never have decided that. (laughs) So he started working out, trying to get in shape. Well, one Sunday night, about midnight, he walked into a gym to lift weights, and he never walked out. They found him the next morning, and we, we believe he just had a heart attack while he was working out. He was a pastor, well loved by many. He had poured out his life in service to the Lord, and many lives were changed because of his ministry. We have always wondered why the Lord took him so soon, because he had so much more to offer. Our family groaned. There was another period of groaning for our family when our daughter Jennifer, and she's sitting right there, uh, was expecting her second child. The first pregnancy was high risk, and she was on bed rest for the last five months. So we knew this one would probably be no different. When she was at 18 weeks of this pregnancy, she went for her regular appointment. And at the doctor's office, before she could get out of the car, there was a large release of blood and water. Our son-in-law, Richard, got her into the doctor and called me with this message. The doctor said, We are losing the baby. So I rushed to pick up Melanie from school, and we got to the hospital as soon as we could. Shortly after we got there, the doctor came in and informed us that the baby was crowning and that the body was in the process of birthing and that before the night was was over that we would probably have this baby. But at 18 weeks, that the baby was not viable, and if it survived, There would be multiple birth defects and abnormalities. So she went on to say, I can give you something to end this quickly so you can start over. Well, that didn't sit well with us. So for the next couple of hours, she sent in three staff members from the neonatal unit to inform us of everything that could possibly go wrong. And after they left, the doctor came back in and uh, asked us, well, what do you want to do? And Jennifer responded, I think we'll let God decide what happens to this baby. So she said okay and left. And we began the agony of waiting for what seemed obvious. At one point, I stood outside the room with my pastor and The only words I could verbalize was, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because I knew, we knew that this baby was literally in the hands of the Lord. Well, Friday night came and went. Saturday morning, drug on, and finally Jennifer said, I can't stay here 
anymore. Just take me home. So we did, and with the prayers of many churches, they were churches all over praying for us, and we survived the weekend. So Monday morning, we called your doctor so we could get a, ask for a referral for a high-risk doc, pregnancy doctor. Uh, and after much persuasion, we finally got a referral on Thursday of that week. And so Friday morning, we went to see the new high-risk pregnancy doctor. And after her examination, she said, there are three things going on here. And for a normal birth, neither one of these things would be desirable. But in your case, they are good. Basically, she described how God manipulated Jennifer's body to keep the baby in. One of them was he, he inverted her womb so that it was no longer lined up with the birth canal. With those issues, God made it impossible for that baby to be born naturally. And because of God's provision and our decision not to follow the first doctor's suggestion, Miss Emerson Lee Woodard was born at 37 weeks, healthy and beautiful. <laughs> Two weeks ago, at University Heights Baptist Church, Melanie wasn't here in service because she was over there to listen to this. Precious. We endured a temporary suffering or groaning, but God showed his glory in his gift of Emmy. Verse 23 tells us that we go through times of groaning or suffering, but the Holy Spirit that dwells within us reminds us that this world is only temporary. And one day we will reign with him and experience his glory for all eternity. Chuck Swindoll says it like this. Suffering is a vital part of the path to glory in the Christian life. A.W. Tozer says, God cannot use anyone greatly until he has hurt him deeply. It is not sound doctrine to say that we will not experience difficulties. Jesus certainly did. And in verse 35, which is later on in chapter 8, it says that God's love is with us even if we have to endure trouble or calamity, persecution or hunger, or become destitute or in danger, or even become threatened with death. The, through these times of suffering or groaning, we are able to see God at work in our lives. And it helps us understand just a small part of his sacrificial love for us. I'd like to close by telling you uh, of a remarkable man that I met for the first time back in the 70s. His name was uh, Ken Miedema. He was one of the most gifted singer songwriter, pianist that I have ever met. But his life has not been easy. You see, he was born blind. But with the strength of the Lord, he has overcome all the obstacles that would have kept him from succeeding. And, and he has a zest for life. He loves children. He has written many songs and musicals and collections for children and also um, music for, for us older people, adults. But his songs talk about life. 
his life with its joys and its struggles and how Jesus is his and our source of hope and strength. I would like to share one of his songs with you today. It's called Lord of the Troubled Sea. <laughs> I 
said your grace is enough. Yes, your grace is enough for me. Thank you for joining us online at West Conroe Baptist Church. We stream both our services live every Sunday at 8 and 11 a.m. If you're thinking about visiting us in the near future, you can find us at 1855 Longmire Road in Conroe, Texas. Visit our website at wcbc.us for more information on our church's full list of events, services, missions, and more. You can also give on our website under the e-giving tab. At Giving, we want to thank you for joining us online, and we hope to see you soon here at West Conroe Baptist Church.